as we know, women remain underrepresented at every level of leadership, particularly in the C-suite. Um, so we're now going to be exploring the critical role that mentorship and sponsorship play in fostering talent all the way up the ladder, as well as how to put more women on the pathway to leadership. And to moderate this session, I'm thrilled to introduce Anna uh, from the FQ. Uh, she's Chief Next Gen Officer. Hi, Anna Blue. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. This is going to be a really great conversation. It, it will. And we've got um, a, a great group um, talking. So I, I will um, I hand it over to you. But I just wanted to say a huge um, hello and thank you to Jasmine Allen um, from Hennessy XO, Misty Grover from Indeed, and Leona Key from Vistager. Hi all. And Anna, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, I'm Anna Blue, Chief Next Gen Officer at the Female Quotient, where I lead our next gen work, really looking at the pipeline to the pathway that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I always say, as, as women and men look around and say, why aren't there enough women in the C-suite? If we don't fix the bottom, we will never fix the top. So that is the work that I am really privileged to do each day. And I'm so excited to talk to this really phenomenal panel of women. Um, and I know Juliet just gave brief introductions, but very quickly, I'd love to just go around and let each of you introduce yourself um, and speak a little bit more about your role and what it is that you do and why you're excited to have this conversation today. I'm going to go in order on my screen. Hi, Jasmine. How are you? I'm great, Anna. Great way to kick off uh, Women's Month. Um, I'm Jasmine Allen. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Hennessy brand uh, at Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy which is a company that has fashion brands, wines and spirits, cosmetics, hotels, um, very large corporation, but uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to lead the Hennessy business. Great, thank you. Hi, Misty. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Misty Gaither. I am the Director and Global Head of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Indeed. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs on the diversity, inclusion, and belonging team. We say we like to help all people get jobs. And I'm excited to have this conversation today because we cannot effectively live our mission if women are being left behind. So I'm excited to get into our dialogue. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I love that Indeed has included the word belonging. I think that's so awesome and so important. Um, hi, Leona. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, my name is Leona Key. I am the president of VistaJet US. VistaJet today, we're the largest and we're the only global, truly global avi private aviation company. Um, we fly our customers around the world, corporates and individuals, um, from point A to point B, anywhere in the world. And uh, I'm proud to say that 40% of our employees are female today, and 35% of our managers are female, and which I'm going to talk about more during our conversations. Amazing. I love that. Um, all right, so I feel like just with this first conversation alone, we could talk for 30 minutes, but, um, but if each of you had to sort of give your, your top answers to what are the biggest challenges to women when it comes to pathway, when it comes to access beyond what we call the messy middle, that sort of middle management where we see so many women get stuck, what are those challenges, Missy? Wow, um, where where do I begin? Because there are so many. Um, as I was thinking about how I wanted to answer this question, I think a lot of times some of the barriers to women kind of getting on that path to leadership is that a lot of the opportunities that are becoming available are made known well before they are posted and we have an opportunity to view them. And so a lot of the, the late night happy hours, the golf course outings, the trips to the racetrack, that's when those deals are being brokered. And we have to find a way to create that same environment for ourselves. Um, I think there's also a lot of assumptions about the competencies and capabilities of women and decisions are made for women without us being consulted about what's best for our path. And that's a big topic right now is the return to work program. And as we've seen so many millions of women exiting the workforce because of the COVID pandemic, um, what are we doing to create opportunities for them to return? Or how do we support them so they don't feel like they need to exit and then are further behind um, on their path to uh, leadership? So. Um, 
there, there's a lot to be said there, but I want to make sure I give everyone an opportunity to, to give their answers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if anybody hasn't been following, to your point, the numbers that have come out each month about the number of women at all levels um, and in, across all industries, even women executives who are leaving the workforce because of the pandemic, um, I really encourage everybody to look at that. It is, it is a very stark reality. Um, Jasmine, how about you? What do you feel like are sort of, sort of those biggest challenges um, for Pathway? I think Misty really hit upon you know the the point that i was going to make which was opportunity just given the chance to step up to the plate and it's because there are suppositions made about our capability um and and to her point a lot of the discussions that lead to senior level positions happen you know outside of the normal nine to five timing right and and we may not be privy to what those are um i also think that there's almost this this thought that women have to be a certain type of leader, right? That maybe the HR lead may be offered to women or, um, you know, roles that seem like they're not super uh, analytical or um, or quantitative, you know, and, and I think that's completely remiss because um, I think women can truly do anything. And I think there's a, a limited view at times of, you know, what a woman is capable of and the skills that she possesses um, I, I don't think that a, a woman should be limited just because she's a woman. And there's a and there's an assumption that, you know, she's better at what they call the softer skills. Um, you know, I know so many women who are, you know, phenomenally adept at every single skill. Um, and so there's a need for, you know, recognition to be had, you know, when it comes to that. And um, in, in ensuring that, you know, women have opportunities to, to be CEOs and COOs um, in addition to some of the other roles that we're, you know, we're relegated to. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, and, and also who said softer skills aren't the right leadership skills anyway, you know, it's like some of the more feminine skills that, that we've come to recognize make some of the best leaders. Uh, so it's interesting that they are constantly overlooked. Leona, from your perspective, what are the biggest barriers or challenges to that pathway to that senior leadership? Um, I think, you know, while Jasmine was saying the stereotype, I was just nodding. I think I completely agree there. I think we really need to hire and promote based on merits rather than a gender stereotype, where I think specifically in aviation industry, there's a lot of that. Like when people talk about aviation industry or private aviation industry, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, you know, as a woman, people assume that you probably work in the cabin. Uh, but I think, you know, for this specific industry, there's a lot of roles. For example, there's 1 million jobs. Preview Aviation create about 1 million jobs a year in the United States alone. And there's a lot of aspects to this industry. You know, there's sales, there's marketing, um, and uh, there's member service, there's private dining, there's coordination between the crew and actually people that make the flights happening and also in the, uh, with, the, with the sales, with the customer facing role. Uh, so I think what really requires in, um, especially my industry, I can see is the education to the general public uh, to make aware that what kind of skill sets that that is require, required to enter this industry. And now that's actually that we can build a pipeline for women to, uh, to enter the industry so that uh, when the time comes, opportunities present themselves, there is a pipeline of women that that can grab that opportunity. Absolutely, pipeline is so critical. Um, really making sure that recruiting practices are more equitable, that um, access to opportunities, as you all have said, are equitable starting from the very beginning all the way through. Um, so let's talk about mentorship and sponsorship. Over the years, I have heard very conflicting views about the benefits of mentorship and sponsorship in the workplace and would love to just hear from each of you um, how you feel mentorship and sponsorship plays a role. Is it truly a key thing to advance women um, and, and for their pathway? Is it something that young women like the women I work with should be looking out for? Um, Leona, what are your thoughts about mentorship and sponsorship? Well, I think it's, it's very important, especially for women. I think as women, you know, enter the workforce, uh, you know, like Ms. and Jasmine entered, um, has mentioned, especially during the pandemic, there's a lot of women, they're forced to exit probably for family reasons or various other reasons that men may not be facing. 
Um, so I think, you know, I myself, I was very lucky when I when I started, I started my career on Wall Street. I had great mentors, uh, men and women that uh, every step of the way when there's, you know, there, there are times that are very, very difficult. You just uh, you're like, OK, I think maybe this is it. This is where I, I reach the ceiling, you know, but I think it's very important to look at people that with the experience and also um, that can encourage you. Uh, just to to power forward. Um, so at VistaJet, like I mentioned before, we have we have 35% women that are that are in the middle management or above. So I think very very naturally that when we when we have the uh, new coming employees and enter VistaJet, we always call it a VistaJet family. So we could you know reach out to them and then they always. Uh, reach out to us to to ask questions, you know, career and also some personal questions. Interesting that um, the misdimension about lots of the decisions are made after hours, uh, and you know, we we at Visa we host a lot of those 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 events and also functions after work for for men and women for them to have the opportunity. And I think also aviation industry in general. Um, every year we have different air shows and this. Uh, MBAA, which is a National Business Aviation Association, is the biggest association for private aviation. And um, the, the conference itself sponsors many women-specific events to do the outreach and also the education and mentorship um, that opportunities that we talked about. Um, Misty, how about you? What are your thoughts on mentorship and sponsorship when it comes to Pathway? So I think they're important, but I think we have an opportunity to evolve the discussion. I think we still look at it as a very antiquated approach. Um, someone is like, hey, I need a mentor. And so they want you to mentor them. And I'm like, that's, that's not how that works. I think mentorship happens organically and it's something that can happen at your same level or you can ask someone who's in a position that you desire to have, but it's not, will you mentor me? It's, hey, I have a question about something you know the person has done and it has to be personalized and it has to be a two-way street. Um, and I look at mentorship as like more, have a squad, have a board of directors where you can be mentored by your own peer group that you develop in addition to what you have on the inside. And I think that mentorship and sponsorship are interconnected. So your mentor might be at a level where they have access to someone who could be a sponsor for you. And I, we know that sponsorships are not always revealed. Sometimes we find out later, sometimes we never find out. And a sponsor is in a position of power to actually change current process to provide access that we may not have had before. And so they have the authority. They can shift what the status quo has been. They can be disruptive because nine times out of 10, they're in that position of leadership or they have the influence and social capital to influence others in a way that a mentor might not. So I think it's absolutely critical, but we need to demystify it and update it to the current workplace and really be um, thinking about how we can have multiple mentors like in our industry, outside of our industry and in our function, outside of our function. Love that. I love the idea of, of broadening like the level that you think about, right? Like you always think about, I want the VP or the senior person to, to be a mentor, but you can learn just as much, if not more, from somebody that is one of your colleagues that, that is a peer who's had a different set of experiences than you. I love that a lot. Um, Jasmine, how about you? I, I saw a lot of nodding over there as Misty was talking. Um, thoughts on mentorship and sponsorship? Um, I think Misty said a lot of phenomenal things. Um, I think that, you know, just in principle, I, I do believe in mentorship and, and sponsorship. Um, I, I think it's been, you know, inst instrumental in my career. And, and to Misty's point, I think it's important to understand the difference between a mentor and a sponsor and how important it is to have both. You know, I think a mentor can help you know, shape you, can help provide guidance, advice. Um, and I think it's almost a no holds barred conversation. There's there's nothing that's off the table, right, um, with a mentor. I think a sponsor, to Misty's point, is in, a, is, in, is in a significant position of influence. And so this is a person in key rooms behind closed doors when you're not present. That can be the person who puts, you know, your name out there and endorses you. Um, and, and usually to Misty's point, this person is in, you know, a position of, of, of pretty substantial power, which means that they can affect change. Um, so that's why it's helpful to have both, 
the mentor that can be there with you every step of the way to guide you along your path and the sponsor who can be the person who can help revolutionize your path. Um, so that, that would be my, my point of view. That revolutionize your path. I like that a lot. Um, all right. So we've talked about some of the things we've talked about some of the challenges. Now what, what do companies do? Missy, what are some key things that you feel like companies should be doing to remove these barriers so that they're not looking around in another 10 years saying, where are all the women in leadership, um, especially with the data around the pandemic and how the pipeline has gotten thinner, uh, certainly over the last year, what should companies be doing right now? So I think companies often wanna start with fixing the women and I fundamentally disagree that we need to fix women. I think that we need to have more men as a part of these conversations and give them the courage to interrupt sexism in the workplace. Um, a lot of times when we talk about underrepresented groups, it is adjacent to the business discussion. You know, when we're talking about revenue and when we're talking about OKRs and KPIs, we don't typically focus on the health of the organization and look at the people piece with the same amount of depth. And so I think our companies and our C-suites, we need to prioritize this and solve for this the way we would do any other business challenge. And so it has to become a part of the company's DNA. We can't just start with the education or let's find a conference or a third party organization. It really is going to take a reevaluation of current systems and processes so we can determine where is the root cause of us not having representation throughout the levels of the organization. And for the people who are in positions to truly affect that, they have to be motivated to do things differently. And people are motivated when things are tied to compensation and tied to their performance. And so I think part of that would be succession planning with intention, um, promotion rates, and we look at the breakdown of all of that information so companies can truly make this transformative um, you know, step towards having more women in, in the C-suite. Of that. Leona, how about you? What would you add to that? How do we remove roadblocks? Um, I think it's to talk about from, um, I'm talking about from my industry, that's where my experience. Um, I think definitely we need to bring in more women uh, into the aviation industry. And so we will have more pipeline. And there is very, I think it's very, very important to advocate um, to the stakeholders and decision makers. Um, that why it is important to have women in the decision making positions um, in the company. And there are researches, you know, from um, McKinsey that show that our company that have women in the key positions that are actually more profitable uh, because of the way that, you know, two, the two genders think differently. Like you mentioned before, you know, there is skill sets that are different. Maybe women have softer skill sets. And I found, um, a lot of times one, uh, for example, women are better at multitasking. And while you're in a very, actually my husband probably would disagree with that, but uh, when you're in a really high stressful job, um, there are a lot of moving elements. For example, private aviation is one. There's always moving elements. My company, we have flights taken off and landing more than 150 times a day. Each flight is different. There's a lot of moving parts and we're flying the C-suites of Fortune 100 companies. Um, so to each flight at each decision le level, who's making those decisions can definitely impact my company's profitability. Um, so I think is, you know, like Misty said, we need to make sure that the stakeholders um, understands why it is important to, to have diversity, to have women um, in the company. Um, so I think that's where the education and the, you know, the advocates, we have to all be the advocates of that. Yeah, absolutely. And you're in such a male dominated field, you know, even talking to young women to get them excited about something that doesn't feel like they have a space in um, can sometimes be challenging. So it's also like that there again, it starts from recruiting and advertising. Are you advertising some of those softer skills and, um, and more feminine leadership qualities? Um, Jasmine, what are your tips and tricks for what should every company be doing right now? I think, um, I actually think that Leona and Misty, you know, they, they covered most of it. So just a couple things I'll add. I think a company has to be realistic with itself, first of all. Um, it has to be willing to acknowledge that there is a female problem. Um, and I think once you acknowledge it, you, you've opened the doorway for real progress. So number one, you have to acknowledge that there's a problem. And number two, 
you have to put real KPIs against changing it. Um, to Misty's point, it's not enough to just sort of pontificate about the need for women and, and diversity. You actually have to, to demonstrate it. And to do that, you have to show real action. And, and I think Misty made a great point when she said that, how do you motivate people? How, how do you get them to take action? Well, you tell them that there's going to be an implication to their financial you know, uh, you know, um, component of their job or to their performance review. So how do you tie these types of goals and, and objectives as it relates to increasing, you know, female presence at, at executive levels, increasing diversity to one's performance objectives, right? Um, is, it, is it part of the, the bonus framework? Um, I think that, you know, you have to put actual policies and policies in place when senior level uh, roles open, you want to make sure that, you know, women are aware of them, that they're actually part of the short list. Um, and I think that's where this idea of effective succession planning, as Misty said, comes into play. But I think you can't make real progress if you're not willing to have a, a, a reflective conversation with yourself. And I mean that as from the company perspective, you know, and acknowledge that this is an area of opportunity and put real action and real basis of measurement um, against it. And I think that's when we're going to start to see a lot more movement in this area. Yeah, absolutely. I love um, your mention of policies and procedures and it being tied to, to performance evaluations. That's really important. And it's interesting that hiring and building teams and effectively leading and building out leadership teams has not been tied to your performance evaluations, right? Like that is actually part of your job um, as a leader is, is putting in place effective, diverse teams. Um, so that that's really important. I want to get to a couple of questions. And actually this last one um, talks about the lack of women already in place as leadership to advocate for um, to advocate for this type of change, to sort of push the needle. And, and one of the things that we wanted to touch on anyway um, is sort of the role of women and like, like more women begets more women, right? Like if you have more women in leadership, it's more women that you can see. Um, so that gets back to what all of you have said about, about opening those doors. But how do we, you know, if this is a company where few women are in leadership, as a younger employee, like, what do you do? How do you figure out what your pathway is without women to look up to, without women to advocate for you? Um, what's next, Jasmine? I think that's where if you don't have women in your organization, that, or you know, then, that, then that's really tough, first of all. But if, if you don't have women in your organization that can help, then that's when I think, you know, hopefully a, a group of people that you can lean on from outside your organization, maybe a group of, of friends or a group of other people that you that you look up to or admire and, and value their coaching and feedback, um, who can help you, who can give you some ideas and can, you know, equip you with the tools you need to go back into your company and go to the voices of, of power, whether that be, you know, heads of HR, heads of the department, and 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 really kind of make a case for the need for more, for the, for the need for change. I think, I think one thing you don't want to be scared about is being the first person to say something. You know, we I wouldn't be sitting here now if there weren't firsts. You know, if, if there weren't people who, you know, who actually took a stand, and even if they were one, only one person, right? Um, people who took a stand, who tried to, you know, to try to affect change. That's why, you know, I'm able to sit here and, and, and speak with all of you ladies today, right? So don't be afraid to be that person. If, if there's not a person in your organization you can look up to, then take the guidance from a group of people that you, uh, that you, that you count on, that you trust, and you be that person. And I know that may sound daunting, but I think there has to be a first for everything. Um, and, and we don't want to let ourselves lose the opportunity to make a change um, just because there may not be a, a, a group of people within the organization that can do it. You can be the person to do it. Awesome. I like that a lot. Misty, what would you add to that, especially as you focus on diversity, inclusion, and belonging, which I love? Um, if there is lack of female representation and leadership, how does, you know, I, I love everything Jasmine just said, to add to that, what are your thoughts for younger employees who are looking at that and saying, my path's not clear? Um, I, I echo what Jasmine said, you absolutely have to look outside of your workplace. Um, I would even take it a step further. If you take that courage that Jasmine just mentioned and inquire and, you know, be, try to be the first, and you're met with a lot of resistance, then you have a different thing to evaluate and you really have to question yourself 
and say, is this the right place where I, I need to be establishing or growing my career? And sometimes it's not always a woman that will put you on the path to leadership. I think in support, it's important for us to recognize that some of us are here because of investments that men have made or non-gender conforming um, individuals have made for us. And so even if you don't see a woman, um, a lot of people have partners they have daughters and so they're looking for ways to help and they may have they might just have a blind spot and so you might be the first person that kind of activates their allyship for them and then they can advocate on your behalf that way and so i guess in summary be courageous like jasmine said you might have to be the bold person and be the first if you're met with a lot of resistance then there are so many other opportunities you can pursue where women will be valued in the workplace and you know, tap into to the men who are in positions of power um, and allow them to be an ally and open up pathways for you as well. I love that. Um, I think that's really important too because if it's not brought to their attention, if they're not having those conversations, like you said, it could be a blind spot. Um, sometimes there's just a level of ignorance of not realizing until somebody, until the media, you know, or glass door or somebody points it out that it's an issue, they, they are just blind to the fact that it's an issue, which is its own problem, of course, um, by itself. Leona, how about you? I know you said that in, in terms of management and leadership, uh, your company is actually, VistaJet is doing well when it comes to representation of women. How important do you think that has been for building that pathway, especially in such a male dominated or, or what is thought to be the male dominated field of aviation? I think, um, you know, talking from uh, personal experience, I was on Wall Street for over a decade and now I'm in the aviation industry. Those are two industries that don't have many women representations. But I think the question you ask, if you're in a company, there are not many women in leadership position. I think it's a very tough, uh, to be honest, it's a pretty tough situation. But then if you look at it as an individual, if you chose to join that organization, I think it's pretty bold. You have to believe in something to make that decision, right? In your career move. Um, but like Jasmine said, I think um, each young person, young female, um, the next generation, I think we should encourage them to have, you know, to be courageous, to be the change agent themselves, because there's always going to be a first. Uh, you could be the first person uh, in the leadership position in your company. Um, as a female employee, I think when you don't have someone to that you think that you could look up to to relate to, um, you can always look outside of your company, especially in the same industry. There are other companies that you could look at um, to find people that you could maybe have a conversation with uh, to learn from them how to be the change agent and also look for mentorship and sponsorship within your company, uh, perhaps you know, from men, I think a lot of like, like Misty said, um, a lot of men, they do, uh, they are the change agent for women to become leaders. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you're all talking about courage. I think that's so cool. Um, all right, so we only have a couple of minutes and I want to um, make sure that I get to questions. And one of them is about the pandemic, which I think is really important. We are connecting in such a different time right now. We're not having the same side conversation, um, especially if you are coming into a new role and you haven't established the same relationships. Uh, what advice do each of you have as women are you know, trying to find mentorship or sponsorship or they're trying to create relationships with leadership uh, to understand what their pathway could be uh, to that leadership level in the midst of a pandemic? Any ideas, uh, Leona, let's start with you of how to connect in a unique way, um, in an important way during this time? Um, it actually has been a very special, I would say also different time uh, for people in my industry, in private aviation industry, because we, our industry actually seen a surge um, in business. It's a very large surge. So um, throughout the last year, I would say half the time we were all walking, working from home. Um, but the workload has been doubled in some days. Um, and I'm very proud of the team and the company, like how we delivered that. We were committed to taking our customers around the world from point A to wherever they might want to be with their loved ones or wherever that safe place is. 
uh, what we have been doing is that, uh, for example, for my team, uh, we're holding Zoom calls actually daily, sometimes three times a day to connect with different uh, team members to make sure that, first of all, they're doing okay. Secondly, that they are uh, doing everything that they can to make sure that each flight happen. Again, it's very important to us. And I think for women, um, there are challenges that are specific. Uh, like for example, myself, I have three children. Um, you know, during the pandemic, I'm, I'm working from home and uh, you know, there are different age groups, all have different set of challenges and different set of needs. And working from home, the multitasking, the support group is very, very important. Um, has been very important to me. Um, and uh, we have been, uh, for example, we have offices around the world uh, since August. We have been making sure that we keep our different offices open. So for employees that do need to come to the office to do their job, they have that choice. We make sure that you know we're COVID compliant here. Um, and we also have uh, a very good group of people in human resources that make sure that they're always open to talk to people when they do need help um, from different perspective. That's really great. Um, Jasmine, how about you? What are some different things people should think about in terms of making those connections or finding leaders or mentorship um, in such a weird time? I think that the one thing the pandemic has taught us all is that people long for, for connection. Um, and our inability to have physical face-to-face -face interaction with each other has been really hard. And I think it's made us appreciate um, that ability even more. So I think if you can create an environment where someone else feels that they have a moment of, of kind of sort of deep connectivity with you, whether that's, you know, offering to, you know, to reaching out to a leader that you might think could be helpful to you on your career path, and saying, you know, do you want to do a virtual coffee? Do you want to do, um, you know, kind of a almost a virtual um, lunch and learn? You know, I I get to know you, you get to know me. Um, we eat lunch together. Um, you know, to talk about where I've been in my career, where I'd like to go, and for me to get any advice you might have. I think these very simple steps allow you know leaders number one to be able to to be involved in your process but it also again takes into consideration that people like one-to-one -one interaction and it's really hard to have it now um so you're meeting a need on kind of a human level while also getting what you need from a professional perspective so i think if you think about you know how you lean into those opportunities that can be really helpful to you i also think that you know recognizing that the pandemic has made things a little bit more arduous that just means that sometimes your research has to be a little bit you know a little deeper right um you know how how do you maybe leverage linkedin and and search for different you know opportunities like this conferences like this summits like this right where you can come together with other women um who are focused on on being the best they can both, both personally and professionally and and you know fellowshipping with them learning with them growing with them and those are things that can really kind of revitalize you and make you feel great. And you can take those things back, you know, to your job and to your team and organization. Um, so I think, you know, those two things uh, could be helpful in a pandemic environment. Yeah, absolutely. That's really great advice. Um, Missy, over to you. And, and also a, a question sort of related to that. Are there ways that the pandemic has leveled the playing field in terms of this for women? Because there's not the golf game happening in the same way. Happy hour is, you know, they're not going to the strip club or or the bars or any of those things, you know, all the things that, that women are typically left out of that happen, let's be honest. Um, does it in some way level the playing field or is it just still the same sort of unleveled playing field, but showing up in a different way? So I, I love what, what Jasmine mentioned, like doing the research and getting more creative and everyone is longing for one-to-one -one interaction. And so that's how I was going to position this. The pandemic has created a lot of barriers and has made it a very difficult and challenging time. But I would reframe that and say, wow, like the people who are the most difficult to connect with are also at home. And so we all have that in common now. And so they're likely more accessible than they would ever 
would be if they were still maintaining aggressive travel schedules, meeting schedules, et cetera. And I know for some leaders at my company have set up office hours. So like, see if they have just like a drop in time that's open and take advantage of that, but know what your value proposition is. And you have to be very well prepared when you go into these conversations. So while we might always all, all be at home, our time is still valuable and people are at a point of Zoom fatigue where they're trying to reduce the amount of time they're spending on the computer. So you have to be thinking about what do I want to learn from this person? Why would they get on the computer and talk to me? Is there another way that I can get this information that I need? Um, but, but absolutely, I think you actually have more access to people than you will ever have. And you might want to uh, consider tapping into this opportunity because we don't know um, when we'll have it, have it again. That is a very good point. People are far more accessible right now than they, than they have been before. And I hear a lot of stories from young women who are sharing with me, like in an internship, that a college student has, they're contacting the CEO because they can, they feel, and they're getting a reply that maybe if somebody was spending all their time on a plane or, you know, out at events, they wouldn't be getting. So, so that's very good advice. All right. So last thing, one minute from each of you at the most, if you had right now, if every fortune 500 CEO was watching this panel, which of course they should be, but if they were all watching this panel right now, and you had one key piece of advice that you wanted to offer them, on how to ensure that there is a pathway for more women in leadership. Jasmine, what would that be? Mine would be to be open-minded. Um, I think sometimes the reason why things don't change is because people are afraid of change or they're just set in a certain way and what they've made, maybe what they've known is only male senior leadership. Um, but I think great things happen when people are willing to, to change their mindset. Um, and so I, I, my, my advice would be to be, to be open-minded. That's great. Leona, how about you? Um, my advice will be to make sure that you listen. You listen to your board, listen to your employees. Uh, and it's the most important thing um, as a leader um, that you can do because just by listening to your employees that will really give them, it will empower them, but most importantly, will really help any leader to bring the organization to the next level. Amazing. Misty? I would tell them whatever they have been doing up to this point to build up their leadership pipeline to stop and do it differently. I would tell them to take the risk on women, on Black women, on Latinx women, on Asian women, the same way they are so quick to give opportunities to people they're familiar with who might not be prepared or the most fit for the responsibility to do it differently, do it scared, be prepared for the criticism, but focus on the impact that that decision can make beyond the tenure that they'll have at that organization. And really think about this in terms of, um, you know, like the, the benefit and the impact to society and think about it beyond just their four walls of an organization. I love that, thank you. Very, very important pieces of advice. Thank you so much. Um, ladies, I have really enjoyed this. Thank you for bringing your insights and experience to this conversation so much that we could unpack. Like I said, we could have spent the whole time just on the, the challenges and barriers alone, um, but your next steps and insights are, are really helpful. And as you can see from the chat, there have been a lot of, of gratitude and appreciation for everything you've shared. So thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. It was a pleasure. Nice meeting you all. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.